Good morning, my good, dear friends in Christ. I'm glad you are joining us either on the live stream this morning or watching this a little bit later. I'm glad you are here. Thank you for joining us for our live stream worship service in this fourth Sunday of Lent. I hope you enjoy what we have to offer you today as we worship together as God's faithful people, not only when we just get together in his house, but also as we gather abroad. We give you great thanks uh, for being here this morning. I want to start off by saying thanks to some very important people, uh, my friends, uh, Quentin Cox and Jory Cox, who are lending us their musical talents this morning. We give you great thanks for coming here and uh, being a part of our worship this morning. Uh, Ruth Cox, who you can't see, but she's in the back. She has worked really hard on our slideshow, and she'll be uh, working with our PowerPoint this morning, so we thank you um, for coming and being a part of this. And then also, good thank you to my good friends, Damon and Carol Tobias, who have done a lot of things behind the scenes to make sure that uh, everyone gets the word and knows that we'll be live streaming our services for the time being and also getting prepared to do so and then uh, here today to film this. We give you great thanks uh, for all the faithful. Uh, this morning we will be um, worshiping uh, with most of the things that we're doing up on the screen this morning. And let us begin with one of my favorite songs, our opening song today, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone.
We began in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving, and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar, O Lord, Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. God gives strength to his people through the hearing of his word, specifically through his gospel promises of salvation on account of Christ. We are truly blessed to have a dwelling place to worship our Heavenly Father. O oh Lord, thank you for the many blessings we receive, especially this beautiful house of worship where we hear your word. Teach me to love the hearing of your word and the reception of your gifts, that I may carry them to those in need. Amen. Come now with repentant hearts and confess all of your sins before our gracious and merciful God. He is waiting to set you free.
your cry for mercy. He knows the faith in your heart. In His amazing grace, God sent His only begotten Son to break the chains that has bound you. Jesus lived the perfect life that we could not. And at the cross, He crushed the power of sin, death, and the devil. Now, you are forgiven. With His resurrection, you know that you are set free. For I need you, oh. with our scripture readings, our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 17, starting at verse 1. The whole Israelite community sent out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, walk on ahead of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled, and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, God. to God. Our gospel reading for this morning is from John chapter 4, starting at verse 5. Jesus came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and flocks and livestock and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks the water, this water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and won't have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come. I have no husband, she replied. 
Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said, just said, is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. O Christ. We sing our sermon song today in Christ alone. Because of your works of righteousness, because of your perfect life 
lived in our stead, Lord, because of the eternal life you won for us through your death and resurrection. We give you great thanks that in Christ alone, Lord, we have courage and strength to meet any day that comes our way. Lord, this morning I ask that you would bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts, Lord. May they be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last week in the Gospel reading, we relived the account of Jesus who met a woman at the well. And I promised you that I would ask you this question. And the question is this, what are you thirsty for? What are you thirsty for? Now, we're in a weird time. We're in a crazy time, one like I have never seen, probably you have never seen before. So maybe those thirsts of yours have changed a little bit for the time being with the advent of the coronavirus. Maybe when you think of thirst for now, the only thing that comes to your mind is a return to normalcy. Maybe that's what you're thirsty for. Maybe you, like me, are thirsty to be on the other side of this thing. Maybe your thirst is to hit the play button on life once again, on a life that has been paused for the time being. I think we all share in this same common thirst. But this morning I want you to think about some of the other thirsts in this life you might have, especially those thirsts you might have in a non-pandemic time like now. What is it that you are thirsty for? A different or better job, maybe? Thirsty for a relationship? Thirsty to feel better physically? Thirsty to have a little bit more breathing room and a little bit more financial security, perhaps? Maybe you have thirst for things in this life that are not necessarily God-pleasing. Maybe some of your thirsts are not what you wish they would be. Maybe there are some of the thirsts that you have that you wish you didn't have at all. Whether our thirsts in this life, our desires are sinful or entrepreneurial or are good for our family, we all have them. It is true, we all have temporal thirst, thirst for the now time, thirst in this life. We hear in our gospel reading today, John chapter 4, verse 5, so he, that's Jesus, came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Today, Jesus meets a thirsty woman. Thirsty for water, thirsty for acceptance, and thirsty for a whole lot more. Jesus enters this town, the town of Sychar, and he sits next to a well, we are told, and he was tired and he was thirsty from a long journey. And a woman from that town comes to draw water. And John makes sure that we know, he makes sure to tell us that it was the sixth hour of the day. That is to say it was noontime. Now this really is strange, folks. Drawing water was a big deal in Jesus' time. Drawing water was a, was a cultural act with a lot of significance in the towns that Jesus would know and that Jesus visited. Drawing water was a task that a woman would almost always do. It was a woman's job, sure enough, but it was a communal act. It was a communal activity. Women from the town would go and draw water together. And they would always go and draw water in the cool of the day. 
primarily in the mornings, but sometimes, yes, even as the sun was going down. And it was during that time that the women of the town would come together and that community was built. And that community of women would talk with one another and catch up and share news. And this woman comes to draw water from the well in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day. And what John indicates to us is that she is a social outlier. She is either not allowed to be in community with the women of her town, or, or maybe she just doesn't feel comfortable with the community of women in her town. And in the midst of this, Jesus speaks to her, and he asks her for a drink of water. Now again, we might miss some of the significance here, but this is sort of strange, folks. Jesus, a Jewish rabbi, should have nothing to do with a Samaritan, much less a Samaritan woman. Drawing water under the cover of the midday sun. And yet Jesus speaks directly to her, asking for a drink, and she is startled. How is it that you, she says, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink? Aren't we supposed to hate each other? Verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. I love Jesus' response here. He says, you know what the crazy thing is, Jesus says, the crazy thing is this, if you knew who I was, if you knew who I am, you wouldn't be alarmed at all by this interaction. In fact, you would ask me for what it is I can give to you. And what I can give to you is living water, not a water you know, and that living water would quench your thirst in ways you are not prepared for, in ways you cannot understand. That living water would quench your thirst in ways far surpassing what you know. Verse 13, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks this water, this well water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. A good response. I get it. I understand it. And yet the woman does not yet, does not know, does not understand what Jesus is offering her. Yes, she says, please sign me up for this water so I will not be thirsty. So I will not have to come here day after day after day, dodging the women of this town and come and get water. Her mind, of course, is on temporal thirsts, a thirst we all have. If I can just get enough water, she says, things will be good. How about you? If I can just get enough toilet paper, things will be good. If I can just get all my grocery shopping done and get through the craziness or get gas in my tank, things will be good. Or what about this one? If I can just make it to payday, things will be good. Or if I can just make it to the end of the school year, or if I can just make it past this big project, then, then things will be good. And then, how many times has this happened to you? You finally make it. 
You finally get there. You finally get to whatever goal you have. And things are good for like a day. Or maybe you finally make it to your goal and things are not as good as you thought they would be. Or maybe things aren't good at all. And you think to yourself, what is going on here? Why is it not enough? Why am I not satisfied? Why am I not quenched? Why am I wanting more, looking for more, or waiting for something else? And at the end of the day, if we do not have the living water that Jesus talks about, the living water of our gospel reading today, we will always, always be thirsty for more. Our temporal thirst is only quenched by quenching our eternal thirst. We all have temporal thirsts in this life, thirsts here and now, and our temporal thirst will only ever, only ever be quenched by quenching our eternal thirst, our thirst for God. Here's something to think about. If COVID-19 was stopped in its tracks tomorrow, like just stopped spreading, and no new cases were reported, if this trending topic in the world went out ten times as fast as it came in, oh Lord, please let it be, if the sports continued, yes Lord, and the movie theaters opened, and the restaurants started serving again, and life was once again back on track, if all of that happens and you are not quenched in Christ, you will still be thirsty, I assure you. You will still be wanting more, waiting for more. You will still be in a perpetual state of lacking something. And that something we know is God. God whose image you were made in. That something is Jesus Christ, who came down, who took on flesh, who took on blood, and lived for you. That something is the Lamb of God, who died your death on the cross, who died in your stead, in your place. That something is the risen Savior, who gave us eternal life. That something is living water. And nothing and nobody can replace it. Nothing and nobody can replace the living water. Every other thing in this world is simply a sad substitute for the Savior. At this point, the woman knows that Jesus is talking about something more than H2O. Verse 26 of our reading, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, the anointed one, the Christ, the one who we've been waiting for, the Savior. She's like, I know the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Jesus knows us. He really knows us. Like, he really knows us and he gets us. He knows mankind. He knows what we need. He knows our desires. For this he took on flesh and blood. Jesus knows the heart of mankind and he knows that our hearts wander and seek out meaning and look for something bigger than ourselves. We cannot help it. That's how we were created. And Jesus... God made man speaks into that heart of man, speaks to our desire, speaks to our need. And what Jesus says is this, Jesus says, what you are thirsty for is me. You may not know where your thirst lies. You may not know how to quench your thirst. You may not ever have enough or 
or experience enough in this life. But Jesus says, that's because what you are thirsty for is me. Nothing can quench your thirst for living water except Jesus. Nothing can quench you like the word of God. Nothing can quench you like the truth and the hope and the joy that the world Savior, Jesus, gives to us. Nothing can give us a peace that passes understanding except for Jesus. Nothing can give us peace and understanding now, right now, today, in the midst of a pandemic of unprecedented proportion. A pandemic of lockdown like we've never seen. Nothing can give us peace but Jesus Christ. And the thing is, this sickness is a good reminder for us. This sickness, this disease, this virus is a great reminder for us of, of a greater sickness we all share. Unlike COVID-19, the coronavirus, the infection of sin has spread to all people of all times and all places. It has not missed, no, not one, anyone. This sickness affects us all. The sickness of sin has no vaccine to pre prevent it. And hand washing and social distancing and trying really, really, really hard to be healthy has zero effect on it. The truth of God has already come down, my friends. You are sick. You are really sick. You are guilty. And the mortality rate on sin is 100%. Everyone who sins dies. And we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No plague or pestilence or disease or virus could boast such numbers, my friends. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And each and every one of you and all of us are only made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ, through the cure of his cross, through the gospel of what Jesus has done for you. And only faith in Jesus heals us from this condition. So if Jesus provides for our thirst, for living water, and that living water, which is the gospel truth of Jesus, wells up in us and wells up in us to eternal life. And if that eternal life puts all of our temporal needs and all of our temporary thirsts into perspective, well, then we only have one important question to ask this morning. How am I quenching my thirst. That is the question you need to ask, my friends. How am I quenching my thirst for living water? Have I arranged my life to make receiving what Jesus has to offer of primary importance? Here's the way to think of it. Is Jesus the pie, the whole pie of my life, where I cut off slices here and there for other things like work, and golf, and Facebook, and vacation, and traveling, and time with family, and all the other things we enjoy doing in this world, or, or, do I think the pie belongs to me? And cut Jesus a sliver here and there. I'm afraid, my friends, that sometimes I act like this. Sometimes I am trying to find a way to fit Jesus into my life. I'm afraid for you, because I'm afraid we all act like this at times. And here's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that many of you out there are dying of thirst and don't know it. I'm afraid that many of you out there 
are dehydrated and dying for the living water that Jesus provides and don't even know it, whether you are an Emmanuel Lutheran member or not. Many of us are feeling this way. I'm afraid that you are more afraid of the threats of this world than you are interested in being filled with the peace of Christ which passes understanding. And so we are all spending too much time in our houses now. <laughs> I know you are. We are all using this time for various things. My question for you is this. My encouragement for you is this. Are you using this time to draw closer to your Savior? Have you had your face in his book instead of Facebook? Are you binging on Netflix only? Which is, by the way, fine. But is that the only thing you're binging on? Or are you binging on his word and his promises for you? In this season of Lent, we are called to a special opportunity to focus on the cross of Jesus. To journey with our Lord. To, in fact, indeed deny ourselves and follow him. Here's a tip for you. You can't quench your thirst for Jesus by simply giving something up for Lent. Denying yourself might sound really, really holy, but the truth is anything you remove from your life, anything you deny yourself, should leave room to focus on the Savior, should leave an opportunity to walk with Him. The reason we deny ourselves, or mortify the flesh, as it used to be called, is that so we can focus on Jesus in prayer, in devotion, and in digging into his word. On this fourth Sunday in Lent, we are called back to the cross of Jesus Christ. And we are called back to the cross of Jesus Christ, not so that we can pour out our best works and present them to God, but rather we are called back to his cross so that we might be filled by him, that we might be quenched in him. Jesus calls us back to the cross so that we once again might taste the living water. Jesus wants to teach all of our thirsts in this life. All of our wants, all of our desires, all of our fears. Jesus wants to teach all of our thirst to bow down to him. And when we are quenched in Christ, when we are quenched in Jesus with living water, all of our other thirsts become easier to quench. It's amazing. It's fantastic. When you are quenched with Christ, when you are quenched with living water, all of a sudden, all of your other thirsts are so much easier to quench. You see your house as a place of refuge. You see your spouse as the gift of God that they are. When you are quenched in Christ, first and foremost, you have more stuff than you ever thought you did. It's amazing. When you are quenched in Christ, you will always have enough because Christ is enough. He's more than enough for you. But if you are thirsty for Jesus, if you are thirsty for his living water, you will never, ever, ever, ever have enough. You will never, ever, ever earn enough. You will never accomplish enough. Ever. So today I want to encourage you, my friends, in the midst of a time where we could be sad for ourselves, where we could look to many other things to find comfort and peace in this world, I want to encourage you this, to hold fast to your Savior, to return to the cross of Jesus, to return to the well of his living water for you. 
To seek Him in His Word in this time. To seek Him in daily prayer. To seek Him in worship and devotion as you are doing and as you have the opportunity to do each day. And especially to seek Him now in this time of isolation. Turn off the news. Turn to Christ. Jesus on only Jesus who has the good news. The news that lasts forever. And he, my friends, he is waiting for you with open arms. And he is waiting for you at his forgiving cross. And he is for you. And he says, I want to quench your thirst. Amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. At this time I want to encourage and invite you to join with me as we confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, we now have the opportunity to join in with one another in the prayers of the church. So I invite you, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, to, to get into a, a place of prayer, whether that be kneeling or sitting or standing, whatever is prayerful for you. And please join me. I'm going to end each petition with the words, Lord, in your mercy. And I invite you to respond. Hear our prayer. In the darkness of sin and its death, we cry to you, O Lord. Open our, uh, our ears by your word, our minds by your spirit, and our hearts by your grace, that we may know and be thankful for all of the blessings you have given to us in Christ our Lord, especially the gifts of forgiveness and life and salvation. Strengthen us in faith that we may serve you with all of our body, mind, and soul and strength. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bidden by your word, we pray to you, O Lord, on behalf of your church and all of your people scattered and isolated. We ask that you would give to us good leaders who will serve us faithfully and boldly, even in chaotic times. Keep them safe. Comfort them and their families and raise up many more who will seek to do the good of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Enjoying the riches of your grace, we ask you, O Lord, to give us generous hearts, that we may share what you have provided us with those who are in need. Give us patience in our seclusion, comfort to those who are lonely, grant relief to the unemployed and the underemployed, and the homeless, and all of their families. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Knowing your healing will and gifts, we pray you, O Lord, to spare us from all calamity by pestilence, scarcity, and fear. Remember the sick in their afflictions, calm those troubled in mind, and keep steadfast those who are dying. This, Lord, we ask that you would be with all of those who we name in this short silence of our hearts.
Show us your gracious will, O Lord, and sustain those who are afflicted in body or mind until that day when you bestow upon us new bodies fit for eternal life that you have prepared for us in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. Mindful of your promise, Lord, we ask you to comfort those who grieve, to build up those who mourn with hope for the resurrection. Remembering the faithful who have died in Christ, we pray you to bring us at last to be with them in your nearer presence, looking forward to the day that when we shall join in the marriage supper of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things, O Lord, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, asking you to grant our prayers, not for our sake, but for the sake of him alone. Teach our hearts to be content with your will and to trust that you will answer us with what is best for us and at the right time deliver, our, deliver us from our needs. So do we pray, giving testimony of our confidence in your gracious favor in Christ by answering with one voice, in Jesus' name we pray, Amen. Amen. We join together in praying the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Give me a drink. Through the interaction of Jesus and the Samaritan woman, Jesus was leading her to see her sin and guilt. He was offering her the way to eternal life by offering her a drink from the eternal well, Jesus himself. Just as Christ forgave this woman her sins, he now freely offers his forgiving love to us and calls us to spread this gospel news. The Lord has promised to be with us until the end of time. May he bless you and keep you in his faith and kindle his love in your hearts so that we may love him and love one another. Amen. Amen. We praise you, O God, because, because even the gates of hell cannot prevent the sown seed of your word from growing. Amen. We at this time sing our closing song, God of Wonders.